Hello and welcome back to the tutorials. Um, I'm going to introduce and show you how to use XNormal. XNormal is a free download and its primary purpose is for baking normals onto low poly meshes. First you want to go into your high definition slot. Um, and let me explain a little bit more. The reason I like XNormal so much is because unlike 3D Studio Max you don't have to visually see it all the time. So you're capable of loading up a really high poly mesh inside of X normal without it crashing down on you. So first thing as you can see I um, added a high poly mesh just by right clicking and adding mesh. Uh, base texture to bake don't worry too much about that because uh, that's just if you have a base texture for the high poly mesh which we don't. Only thing you really need to worry about is the ignore per vertex color. Make sure that's unchecked for now uh, and we're going to get into that later. Use exported normals. Don't do that if you're exporting out of ZBrush. The reason being is because ZBrush just exports faceted normals, meaning nothing's going to look smooth. It might look smooth, but it's not going to look as smooth as it could be. So we move on to low definition meshes and pretty much add a low definition mesh the same way we did, just right click, add mesh. Um, those two numbers we're going to get later. And the same as before, average to normals. Could read, and it's a good thing I did it this time because I totally forgot to do it before I exited 3D Studio Max. So just make sure average normals is checked. Unless you have a very specific normals, then make sure you use export and normals. Use cage only if you have a cage to use. Basically, for the best results, you might want to use a cage, but for this tutorial, we're not going to use one. All you have to do is uh, make a cage in 3D Studio Max and export it out as a separate OBG and add it in here under the external cage file slot. And in case you don't know what a cage is, it's um, pretty much a duplicate of the low poly mesh just spread out to cover the topology of the high poly mesh a lot better. Um, don't mess with these two, everything else, just keep everything else the same unless you run and get errors. So now that we've gone over that, we're going to show you how to get those two numbers. All you have to do is click over where it says tools and you'll see the ray distance calculator. Click on that, click go, and after a while it's going to show you two numbers, well two real numbers that you'll use to plug in there. The reason I say real numbers is because there's only two numbers that have actual numbers in them. Everything else is just zero, 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 zero. So put the first number in the first slot and the second number in the second slot. Now we get to the fun part baking the map. Um, first make sure normal is checked and uh, there's a, something you might want to check after you do that but first we're going to go to the name convention. All you got to do really is name a file, doesn't have to be slash anything, xnormal put that in there automatically and it'll do the rest. Um, TGA exporter, I use that because I like to use TGAs. Only downside is that you can't just throw them into 3D Studio Max. You have to open them in Photoshop first and convert them into 24-bit before you can use them in 3DS. Uh, those are the file sizes. I mean the, the pixel sizes. Uh, length and width. So for now I'm going to put 2048 by 2048. This is just to get the maximum detail out of them for now. You can shrink them down later if you want to and it goes as low as 16 and as high as 8192 I've never baked out anything that big I might try it one day just to see what it looks like but uh, you probably shouldn't need anything that big edge padding is how much stretching along the edge pixels it'll do and basically that's just to prevent any seams from showing up within the texture itself um, Usually try to, 4 is a good number, 16 is probably better if you're doing a really big texture size like 2048 by 2048, but it'll probably suffice with 8. Leave those two the same, don't mess with those. Bucket size is just how fast you'll see it render. Don't mess with the renderer at all. And anti-aliasing, I like to keep this at 0 for Photoshop purposes. It's a lot easier to use the magic wand tool if it's not trying to select anti-alias stuff. So now we're going to move back over to the normal map section. First off, make sure it's checked and then go to the settings next to it just to double check to see if everything's safe. By default, all these are going to be XYZ plus. 
Alright, don't change anything unless you're using 3D Studio Max or the Unreal Engine. If you're using 3DS Max or the Unreal Engine like I do, change this to Y to Y minus. The reason being is because uh, 3DS Max and um, Unreal use a different Y axis direction than most other programs. Bake high poly vertex colors. Remember how I told you to leave that thing unchecked in the beginning? Um, this is where it comes in handy. Basically, poly painting and ZBrush is just painting for vertices. So each vertex has a color. Now, what we're going to do is take the vertex colors off of the high poly mesh and apply them to the UV mapped low v poly mesh. And once those settings are done, all you got to do is click um, generate maps and it'll start doing its calculations and magic. So yeah, if I haven't said it already, I'll say it again. X Normal is an amazing program, especially for free. So, if you can, donate to the guy that made it, and I'm pretty sure he'd appreciate it. But as you can see, I got some really nice looking normals there. I gotta fix some things in Photoshop, but I'll show you how to do that later on. And here's the diffuse texture. As you can see, Richard put a lot of shading in there by default. And you see how it's stretched out after that? That's the edge padding. So, now what we're going to do is uncheck normal and uncheck the bottom one so we can get an ambient occlusion map. Go back and check ignore per vertex color because if you don't it's gonna put the vertex colors on the ambient occlusion map and more than likely you don't want that now me keep everything the same but change the rays to 512 this is just a personal preference you could experiment if you want but keep in mind that generating ambient occlusion maps take a long time so when you do experiment try to keep the size of the AO map low um, and only re like you use ambient occlusion maps to bring out shading and details from high poly meshes that you want to carry on into the diffuse of a low poly mesh. And all it literally what ambient occlusion is, from what I'm understanding, is uh it shines the light on the high poly mesh from every single direction, and parts that receive less light end up being darker than parts that receive more light. So. The reason why you want to be careful with this, and I'll show you about that later too, is some parts are always going to look dark no matter what. But you can fix that in Photoshop. For now, just generate an ambient occlusion map and you'll see why it's cool. Um, I don't have one on this guy yet, but uh, I'll add one later on. And since ambient occlusion maps take a long time to generate, I'm going to stop the recording right here. Alright, so see you next time.